This podcast contains mature subject matter and is intended for entertainment purposes only. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, friend. We're spilling the tea with Tom. Welcome to the Beautifully Ridiculous Podcast. The, the uh, jail itself, you have to be able to utilize it in regards to uh, when people came out of certain areas, like, say, the top floor, mm-hmm. and they came down the stairwells, it was the only place in that jail that nobody could see. Nobody. Oh. So you better be on the ball if you knew there was something going on and get somebody at the bottom and somebody at the top to watch the stairwell because when they came down the stairwell and turned to go down the other one, that's where people got sometimes killed. Right. Right. So I'm beautifully ridiculous and perfect, no less. La da dee da, la da 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 dee da, la 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 dee dee da. In Canada, the criminal legal system is divided into federal and provincial or territory jurisdictions. We have ten provinces and three territories. Provincial or territorial correctional facilities hold people who have been sentenced to less than two years in custody and people being held on remand, which means they are awaiting trial or sentencing. Federal correctional facilities, which are the responsibility of Correctional Service Canada, is concerned with people who have been sentenced to two or more years in custody. Provincial and territorial jurisdiction includes remand for those with a custody sentence of less than two years, community sentences such as fines, community service, or probation, including pretrial supervision, community and custody sentences, and extrajudicial sanctions programs. Youth criminal legal facilities and sentencing are also provincial and territorial, but are usually governed by the ministry responsible for child and youth services, rather than the body responsible for adult corrections. Though immigration detention is facilitated by the Canada Border Services Agency, immigration detainees may also be kept in provincial territorial facilities because either the federal immigration holding centers are full, there is no immigration holding center in their region, or the detainee's file has a link to criminality. So, I mean, you have to be interested in your job. Yes. And like for uh, security, they were not interested in anybody. They opened the door, they closed that door, you know. And that was oh, it. No, not close the inmate. Come on, they frisk him down. That was their job. The thing what made it hard for me is that the inmates would deliberately try to sabotage that person, and as a result, say, say it's inmates working in the shop, and there's oil and grease, and they're doing car or in the kitchen, and uh, so there's. When they come out, the rules are they get frisked down so they don't have a knife and what all that stuff. Well, these inmates, depending on the staff member, would then uh, put something on their their thing here, on their shirt and everything else, ketchup or whatever, greasy. And and then the staff member, uh, they'd come out and they'd stand there like that and the guy starts and runs down the shoulders up the but gets thing, all the grease down on his... up up through the crotch and yeah, all yeah. that kind of stuff but in the meantime the staff members rubbing across all his crap the oh. guys got there so when the guy steps away and the staff next one starts geez he's got to go get changed wash his hands it's greasy so that's the games they played. Sure. If you think you're in charge, wait a minute here. You know how are you? How you? How do you get that recognition? If you're a guard and you do your job, okay. But if you take it to a different level, okay, you take your shoes off. No, that takes you. Take pants off. Okay, take shirt off. Okay, the guy stand up, shirts off. Well, 
Drop him. Oh, he's good. He's jockey shorts on. Right. Don't forget. Drop some chalk on it. Okay. Bend over. Right. Bend over. Yeah. yeah. And that's the routine on the skin frisk. Yes. And staff, that's one of the procedures, how you go through all that kind of stuff. And then have the guy put it on. But there's the trick. If that guy's got a knife, he's got something. When he goes to put that thing back on, that's where you have to position yourself because that blade would be that long. So you would look and see how he picks up his shirt and pick it up. For the and weight of he it? puts his hand over like on the pocket of the pants. Oh. And he picks up the things that way. And he starts, you know, he's still got that and he's... His pants, he's got a hold, and he starts putting his shirt on, you know, getting on. Getting and at that point, 90% of the staff would walk away to do something else because he's getting dressed again. But you're watching. Got an eight-inch piece of violent steel in his hands, grinded up to a razor's edge, and he's maybe going to use that on an inmate. So it's up to people, you know, what is your job, you know? Oh, I shake people down. Do you really? Do you really? Do you, do you, you know? Because they know how you operate. That's yes. what they do. They share information. They sell information for a cigarette. Cigarettes are money. Currency. They, they oh, yeah. trade in cigarette. And if they come in and their parents bring them, maybe yeah, a lot of guys have big things of Ogden tobacco and they roll them. But some, the parents would bring them in sportsmen and that sportsman cigarette, that would be bought and sold through that jail, you know, a hundred different times because people who had status in there, bad people in a way, they would end up with that cigarette and they'd sit in the yard I would always make sure at some point when guys were on the earth, I'd just go by, they had windows and everything, I'd go by the windows and see who was sitting. And you can see the kingpin sitting there. He's got this cigarette. And all the guys are sitting around, you go, you pass to the guy, go, he get it back. There's a guy I've got to get rid of. The kingpin. That guy, because he's controlling that whole thing. Whole group. The staff don't have a, a prayer because he's controlling somebody bringing them cigarettes. So he's got everybody just for little kids around the teacher. What? So anyhow, mm -hmm. if you're interested in what you're doing for a living, take an interest. That's what I did. I love that. I love that. That's really I awesome. mean, it's one thing, go to work and come home and all that kind of stuff. But what's happening in there? And why is it happening? Well, yeah, yeah. Hello, friend. Welcome back to the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Katie Campbell. As I said before, this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. I, this is not a documentary. I am not a historian. If you hadn't noticed, I'm not sure I know what I'm doing. But we're faking it till we make it, okay? <laughs> Great, so glad you're along for the ride. Anyway, so in order to just because interest sake and I fell down the rabbit hole, I talked to Tom and I fell down the rabbit hole. I wanted to know more about the Canadian prison system and how it all came about and what our history was and yada, yada, yada. So I am going to read for you some of the information that I found. I just started, you know, good old Google, okay? Good old Google, like I said. I am, this is not a documentary. I am not a historian. I'm just a person doing a podcast. So July 1st, 1867, Canada is created with the Proclamation of British North America. At that time in 1867, Canada consisted of four provinces, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. Manitoba joined Canada in July of 1870, and British Columbia joined Canada in... 1871. PEI joined in 1873. The Yukon joined in 1898. And the Northwest Territories joined in 1905. At the time that the Northwest Territories joined Canada in 1905, the Northwest Territories included Nunavut, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. 
So it was kind of like half the freaking country. Newfoundland joined Canada in 1949, and then Nunavut finally was carved out in 1999. I remember, I remember all of the maps at school having to be um, taken down because they were incorrect. There was also maps of the USSR when I was going to school. So let's just not date ourselves too much here, Katie. Okay. So anyway, after joining the Federation, uh, somebody somewhere realized that west of Manitoba, there wasn't a penitentiary. So when British Columbia joined in 1871, the closest penitentiary would have been in Manitoba. And that was kind of problematic. So they decided to change things by building the BC Penitentiary in 1878. But before they get to the BC Penitentiary in 1878, I did find out that we actually, across the street from the former Kingston Penitentiary in Kingston, Ontario, there is a Museum of Canada's Corrections. What's it called? It is called Canada's Penitentiary Museum, and you can look it up online. It says, and I found this part really fascinating, I'm going to read from this website. It says, Prior to the Confederation of Canada and the establishment of the federal government in 1868, there were three penitentiaries operating in British North America. These were referred to as, quote, provincial penitentiaries, not in the modern sense of the word. The first provincial penitentiary of the province of Upper Canada was opened in 1835, is now called the Kingston Penitentiary. Next came the Provincial Penitentiary of the province of New Brunswick, which opened circa 1842. It's also known as the St. John Penitentiary. Following that was the Provincial Penitentiary of the province of Nova Scotia, which opened in 1844, a.k.a. Halifax Penitentiary. At Confederation, these three facilities were designated as the first federal penitentiaries. Back to British Columbia. Okay. What I found fascinating too is, um, because you forget, I live on Vancouver Island, but you forget if you don't travel across this country very often, you forget how freaking bloody big it is. Like, it's all day. It's all bloody day to get from one side to the other. You get on the airplane, you're up in the air for like a full movie and you realize, "Mm, I'm only just, I'm only just east of the Rockies now. Dang. Like, it's an enormous country. So if you've never flown across it, See if you ever can, because it's mind-boggling. It blows your bloody mind. Canada, at its widest part, is 9,306 kilometers wide, or 5,780 miles wide, from Cape Spear, Newfoundland, to Mount St. Elias in the Yukon. I just had to say Elias, Mount St. Elias, because my son's name is Elias, and, you know, that. Yay me. So, um, the BC Pen was built in 1878. It was built as a maximum security prison housing 765 men, and it is located or was located in New Westminster, B.C. The B.C. Pen, or the Pen, as it was known as, operated for 102 years from 1878 to May of 1980. It closed permanently at that time. A lot of the information that I am about to give to you, I just found on Wikipedia. Um, You can go look it up as you like. The British Columbia Penitentiary, commonly referred to as the BC Pen and the Pen, was a federal maximum security prison located in New Westminster, British Columbia, Canada. The BC Penitentiary operated for 102 years, from 1878 until it was decommissioned in 1980. And as I said previously, it was the first federal penal institution west of Manitoba. After British Columbia joined Confederation in 1871, and with the population of Western Canada increasing, the need for a federal prison in Western Canada became apparent. The fact that the Transcontinental Railroad had not yet been constructed made transporting prisoners long distances east to the other federal institutions costly and difficult, which further exacerbated the need for the BC Pen. Okay, so just this little soliloquy here, because the information that I have in this episode is very long, and I wanted to break it up for you a little bit um, at at the suggestion of George. I love George. Thanks for, George edits everything I do, because he's just the sweetest thing ever. 
Thank you, George. What George suggested to me was that I also include something about the last spike. And I have been to the last spike. The last spike is symbolically the last place that a spike was driven into the Canadian Railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, the CPR, the Canadian Pacific Railway. And the last spike is a historical site just out of Revelstoke in uh, a city, a little town, Craigalahi, British Columbia, outside of Revelstoke. Canadian Pacific Railway, the last spike was driven in November 7th, 1885. Now, the reason why that is significant is, again, there was no penitentiary west of Manitoba. There was no penitentiary. Canada became Canada with the British North America Act in 1867. And then in 1871, British Columbia joined Canada. But they joined Canada with the expressed reason because they were promised by the Canadian government that the railway was coming and coming swiftly to connect Canada. British Columbia to the rest of Canada. Because if you think about it in a geographical perception, uh, the Rockies are something to have to get over or through. Have you ever driven the Coquihalla? It's a heck of a highway. There's a ton of things that have to happen in order to get a railway through or to get a penitentiary built. And so we didn't have a penitentiary until 1878. And the actual, the Canadian... Pacific Railway wasn't finished until 1885. So in 1871, British Columbia became part of Canada. We did that with the promise of having a railway, and the railway didn't come till 1885. 1871, we joined. 1878, the BT- BC Penitentiary opened. And in 1885, that is when the last spike was driven in to the railway just outside of Revelstoke in Creek Gallaghy, British Columbia. November 27th, no, excuse me, November 7th, 1885. We're going to interrupt this program right smack dab in the middle to remind you to like, share, subscribe, and also that my first love is music. I am a musician. I have another YouTube channel out that has my music on it. My music is everywhere that you stream on every bloody platform because I've paid for all of that. So please make sure that you go and find me and find my music. You can find me on TikTok, Amazon, Amazon. Yeah, you can find me on Amazon Music, Apple Music, uh, Shazam, all that bloody bullshit. Okay, look, you guys, I'm just like everybody else. I have two kids and a mortgage. I'm equally trying to pay those things off. Can you pay children off? Can you pay them to go away? I'm kidding. I love my children. But, you know, if you're a parent, you'll get it. Okay, love you. Bye. Planning and construction for the BC Penitentiary began in 1874. The site was selected as a hillside overlooking the Fraser River in the Sapperton neighborhood of New Westminster. Not New Westminster, New Westminster. I I have a penchant for saying things correctly. You know, like poinsettia or miniature. There's a vowel in it. Can we make sure we say the vowel? Thank you, pet peeve. Okay, be quiet. Uh, Where are we? The prison received its first inmates in 1878 and opened without fanfare. The buildings and structures that made up the BC Penitentiary site were added gradually. The original complex comprised the main gatehouse and a few brick and wooden buildings. The large cell blocks which housed most of the inmates were constructed between 1904 and 1914. The BC Pen was replete with structural problems when it opened, including flooding of the basement, faulty plumbing and heating, bars either missing from windows or not properly affixed to the walls, and the lack of proper medical facilities. Major repairs and renovations were conducted over several years to remedy these issues, with most of the work performed by inmate work crews. The site was initially fenced by a wooden fence, which was soon upgraded to a 30-foot rock wall and finally 40-foot concrete walls. Guard towers were located on each corner. Until 1961, the prison incorporated a farm located across the street from the penitentiary where some inmates would be assigned work. The farm produced a sizable portion of the food used in the institution's kitchen. The farm was economically viable well into the late 1950s. However, increasing costs of its operation, decreasing costs of buying food from outside sources, the perceived decline in the usefulness of providing agricultural training to inmates and the increasing urbanization of the surrounding area led to the decision to close the farm and sell the farmland to the city of New Westminster. Staffing requirements increased over time in accordance with standards dictated by the Canadian Penitentiary Service, CPS. 
They were 171 in the mid-1950s. Okay, so staff were 171 to over 700 inmates in the mid-1950s and had increased to 363 staff in 1976, despite a decrease in the prison population during this period. The B.C. Penitentiary experienced severe overcrowding starting in the 1950s, holding as many as 765 prisoners in 1958. The Canadian Penitentiary Service attempted to alleviate this by transferring inmates to other institutions, such as the recently opened William Head Institution on Vancouver Island. By the mid-1960s, the population had been reduced to around 500 inmates. However, this did not prevent the series of violent riots and hostage takings that plagued BC Penitentiary in its final years. On March 12, 1979, Correctional Service of Canada announced that the BC penitentiary would close. Inmates were gradually transferred to Kent Institution with the last inmate leaving on February 15, 1980. For two weeks in May 1980, the prison was opened to the public for the first time. Over 80,000 attended the open house. Although the BC penitentiary had opened with no ceremony or fanfare, 102 years later, a formal ceremony attended by various dignitaries was held to mark its closing on May 10, 1980. Most of the buildings on the former BC Penn site have been demolished and replaced by residential housing and parkland. Only four parts of the original prison still remain. The gatehouse, which is now a sports bar. The coal house. The original center block, which has now been converted to offices. And the cemetery. The BC Penn site included a prison cemetery called Boot Hill. The remains of most inmates who died at BC Penitentiary were claimed by their families. Those that were not buried at Boot Hill. All work relating to the cemetery, such as digging graves, site maintenance, and the construction of grave markers and coffins was performed by inmates. The cemetery officially opened in 1913, but was probably in use in 1912. The remains of approximately 50 inmates are still buried there. During the cemetery's early years, records were not carefully taken or preserved and are, therefore, unreliable. Most graves are marked by small concrete gravestones engraved only with the inmates' prison number. Some inmates were buried in unmarked graves. Although most of the prison has been demolished, the cemetery still remains in what is now Glenbrook Ravine Park. After BC Penitentiary closed in 1980, the federal government ceded the cemetery to the city of New Westminster. Very few people know that the cemetery is there. It is maintained by the city of New Westminster and has an information plaque with prisoner grave information. The cemetery is mentioned in the history section of Glenbrook Ravine Park. The BC Penitentiary contained the standard features of a maximum security prison of its era. These included, among other things, cell blocks, offices, a hospital, a kitchen, work and school facilities, and two chapels, one Catholic, one Protestant. One peculiarity was that there was no dining hall. The inmates had to eat their meals in their cells. In its latter years of operation, the daily routine for inmates in the general population was as follows. Rise at 7 a.m., Clean cell, shave, and wash up. Get breakfast from the kitchen and eat it in the cell. Report for work at 8 a.m. Leave work for 11.30 a.m. Pick up lunch and return to cell for count and lock up. Eat lunch in the cell. Work from 1 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. Collect dinner from kitchen. Return to cell for count and lock up. Eat dinner in cell. Leisure period from 6 p.m. until 9 p.m. in the winter, 10 p.m. in the summer. Must be back in your cell for 11 p.m. Methods of punishment for violation of prison rules employed within the BC Penitentiary evolved along with the times. Corporal punishment was initially the preferred method of, for a number of infractions, with flogging being the most common. Corporal punishment was gradually phased out until it was banned outright in 1972. Other common form of punishments included working on the chain gang, punitive diets of bread and water, and solitary confinement. In B.C.'s penitentiary, more modern incarnation, punishments tended to be more bureaucratically managed. The most common forms of punishment were loss of privileges and solitary confinement. Solitary confinement, officially called dissociation, is commonly referred to as segregation and was a common form of punishment at the B.C. penitentiary. 
Prisoners could be placed in segregation for three reasons, at their own request, as punishment for up to 30 days, or for administrative purposes for an unlimited amount of time. In practice, administrative segregation was often used to punish prisoners. Controls on the use of administrative segregation were extremely discretionary and thus open to misuse. It was common for prisoners to be kept in solitary confinement for months or even years at a time. One example, an inmate named Jack McCann spent 1,421 days, 754 of those consecutive, in solitary confinement between 1970 and 1974. Formerly known as the Special Correctional Unit, the SCU, the solitary confinement cells were commonly called the penthouse by inmates and staff, partly due to their location on the top floor of one of these cell blocks. The penthouse had been built in 1963 to replace the old solitary confinement cells that were in the basement, which were known as the hole. BC Penitentiary solitary confinement cells were known as being particularly brutal for a modern prison. The cells were extremely small, with three concrete walls with no windows and a solid steel door with a five-inch window facing the corridor. The cells contained only a wash basin toilet combination, cold water only, and a radio selector. There were only two channels, a concrete pad covered with a sheet of plywood four inches off the floor on which the inmates slept. Inmates could not control the volume of the radio nor the temperature of the cell. The lights in the cell remained on 24 hours a day, but were dimmed to 25 watts at night. Inmates who were in the SCU, the Special Correctional Unit, for disciplinary or administrative reasons could be confined to their cells for 23.5 hours per day. They would be given half an hour of exercise, which consisted of walking alone in the corridor between cells in the SCU. They didn't even get outside. A rubber pad and blanket would be delivered in the evening and collected each morning. The inmates would not have any opportunity to see the outdoors. Inmates who were in the SCU for protective custody would be allowed to retain the rubber pad and blanket throughout the day and would sometimes be permitted to exercise outdoors for half an hour per day. Inmates were not permitted to speak to one another, work, attend school, visit the library, watch TV, or engage in any other interactive activities. In addition to the harsh conditions, harassment and abuse by the guards in the SCU was widespread and endemic. Like most maximum security prisons of its vintage, BC Penn experienced a number of inmate suicides, self-mutilations, assaults, stabbings, escape attempts, and murders throughout its history. In its later years, BC Penitentiary became known for its riots and hostage takings. The BC Penn had few major violent incidents in its early history. It did not experience its first riot until 1934. Remember, it was opened in 1878. It's 56, oh yeah, it did not experience its first riot until 1964 in its 56th year of operation. However, it began to experience exponentially more of these major incidents as the facility aged and became less suitable as a modern prison. Most of BC Penn's major violent incidents occurred in its final 10 years of operation in the 1970s. During the 70s, BC Penn was one of the most violent federal institutions in Canada. The worsening of conditions and increasing number of violent incidents at the BC Penn contributed to its decommissioning in 1980. On September 1, 1934, rioting began when seven prisoners refused to do their assigned work. By September 10, 73 prisoners were striking. Furniture and toilets were smashed, as well as 182 windows. The riot ended on September 12th when its leaders were paddled. The inmates were protesting generally poor conditions and also demanding that they be paid for the work that they did. The riot was instrumental to the Canadian government implementing a policy of paying its federal inmates five cents per day. On April 20th, 1963, a guard found three prisoners attempting to escape. The guard guard fired at the prisoners, and they responded by throwing Molotov cocktails. The three inmates, led by inmate Jerry Casey, took guard Pat Dennis hostage, and along with 15 other inmates, locked themselves in the auditorium. Other prisoners then began starting fires and destroying the prison. The inmates insisted on negotiating through local broadcaster Jack Webster. The mad ringleader, Jerry Casey, his lean face suffused with anger, stuck the knife against Dennis's throat and screamed at me, Webster wrote in a story for the Vancouver Sun. Tell Warden Tom Hall, if he pulls brakes here, the guard dies first. You'll die too, Webster. 
We all die. Get on that telephone. This is not my Tom. This is a different warden Tom. But I guess everybody's named Tom. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Canadian Army restored order to the prison except for the auditorium. The hostage takers' only demand was that they be transferred out of the BC pen, and the incident ended after this demand was acceded to. That was 1963. Riot number three, 1973. A three-day riot started on October 5, 1973. Twenty-three cells were destroyed. In February 1975, a staff member was held hostage for four hours. On June 9, 1975, at approximately 8 a.m., 15 prison staff were taken hostage by three inmates. The incident lasted from June 11 at 1 a.m., a total of 41 hours, when an armed tactical squad of prison officers stormed the prison. One of the inmates convicted murderer Andy Bruce grabbed hostage classification officer Mary Steinhauser to use as a human shield. The 32-year-old Steinhauser was killed by friendly fire while Bruce was shot twice but survived. A commission of inquiry was appointed to determine the causes of the incident. The findings included... Prior to the riot, each of the three hostage-takers had spent considerable time in solitary confinement, which was known for being inhumane, and that the inmates were released directly from the SCU into the general population without adequate supervision. Deplorable conditions at the BC Pen contributed to high staff turnover. In 1974, the rate of turnover for correctional officers was 61.2%. There was also a major backlog in training for correctional officers. Many staff who were on duty when the riot started were not adequately experienced nor trained. The facilities were ancient and not suitable as a modern prison, which contributed to the environment with a high potential for further incidents. Serious overcrowding, lack of cooperation and communication between staff, poor control of knives in the kitchen, lack of an alarm system in certain buildings. On July 4th, prison staff member was held hostage by a prisoner for eight hours. That was 1975. In 1976, a year later, also in February, I don't. I guess they're coming out of Christmas season in the dead of winter. In February 1976, three prisoners took three guards hostage for almost 15 hours. In April of 76, four prisoners took three guards hostage for 13 hours. Two prisoners were also found dead in that month. In June of 76, prisoners attempted to take two guards hostage. They escaped with minor injuries. On August 31st of 76, one prisoner briefly took a guard hostage. September 9th, 76, there was a 12-day state of emergency when, regar- when guards refused to work overtime. Three inmates died during this period. The largest major incident in the BC Penitentiary's history started on September 27th, 1976. A large percentage of the inmate population started rioting as they were released from their cells for showers. Over the next few days, the inmates destroyed most of the cell blocks and several other parts of the prison. They destroyed the internal walls between cell blocks, which had stood for nearly a century. In many cases, they destroyed them with just their bare hands. The principal complaints were abuse by the guards and the refusal by the guards to follow new, more humane directives. Two guards were taken hostage. Police riot control squads and the Canadian Army soldiers surrounded the perimeter of the prison. After the newly formed Citizens Advisory Committee arrived on site and began participating in negotiations, the hostage takers released one hostage in a show of good faith and a nine-point deal was eventually struck on October 2nd, peacefully ending the riot and hostage taking. So that was September of 1976, and the bloody thing was finally closed in May of 1980. Oh my goodness. So see, friend, didn't I tell you that I would go on like a 20-minute diatribe? And I have. It's almost 40 minutes into the run of the third episode, and I have only gotten to the BC Penitentiary. I told you I was going to do a whole timeline, and I've only, I've only completed one. This is okay. So the BC Penitentiary was built in 1878 and it closed in 1980. And then in the uh, second episode, uh, last time I talked to you about New Haven Farm. So New Haven Farm, I'll briefly tell you that and then we'll hear from Tom. And then I will tell you about Ocala in the fourth episode. 
So we had the BC Penitentiary, 1878 to 1980. That was maximum security prison. Then we had the Borstal system uh, that was adopted and New Haven Farm that opened in 1937. New Haven was established on the southeast side of Marine Drive in Burnaby at the end of 1937. The facility housed 19 individuals with two staff. It was also one of the first initiatives in Canada to segregate young inmates in a separate institution from the adults. Superintendents A. McLeod and Ernie Stevens were appointed to manage the facility. A training program based on the honor system was implemented and individuals were trusted not to leave the property. New Haven empowered them to adapt to the community with the aid of supervision when released. Besides farm work, there were courses in mining, woodworking, first aid, English, elementary school, and finally the New Haven Correctional Center closed in March of 2001, so it ran from 1937 to 2001, the BC Penitentiary ran for 102 years from 1878 to 1980. How interesting. On episode four, I will talk to you about Ocala Prison. So next time on the Beautifully Ridiculous podcast, I will be going into Ocala Prison and Ocala Prison Farm, which was the first time a women's institution was opened in British Columbia. Thank you so much for being here. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. I am also a singer. I have three albums out. I have Rhythm Gypsy, The Troubadour's Gypsy, and Rock and Roll Gypsy, which are out anywhere that you stream. I'm also all over TikTok. You will find on the Beautifully Ridiculous Podcast Instagram page, I'm going to put up some photos of a Gibbons key and some of the newspaper clippings that I have found. So everything will be there on the Beautifully Ridiculous Instagram page. You can find me personally on TikTok, Katie Campbell, underscore 1983 music and you can find my music anywhere that you stream but for now let's go back and listen to some more stories from tom and so that you know so <laughs> so the guys say to me and i was in the gym there in a white uniform and i was pretty athletic and all that kind of stuff but uh, these guys would come in and were working out with weights and all that kind of stuff so i wouldn't say nothing but then I'd go get a little booklet, which uh, one muscle helps the other muscle. And uh, if you go and you put too much weight on, then this muscle gets destroyed and the tendon dies. So your arm gets weaker. And you, so you can't just go and say, hey, don't do that, don't do that. You gotta let the guy think it out. Say, hey, Larry, I just want you to read this thing. When you finish, I want it back. If you just said, keep the guy, probably throw it away. I want that back. They read it all about the weights. And next thing, these guys are doing what I set up in the gym as circuit training. So it wasn't heavy weights anymore. And these guys with muscles just like, and they walk like this, you know, leg muscles, it wasn't in there. And the sight lightweights, one, two, three, four, five, six, ten, boom. Yeah. And then run, kick that thing on the thing, and back, kick the other one. You have markers, how high you kick, and keep your balance. Set up a circuit training thing. Not only that, the big bulky guys, they were kind of put aside. Everybody was into circuit training. And they'd all go down the gym, and, and they, all the way around the wall, there'd be guys doing this, doing that. So, it just, what it, what it, it just makes your day go along uh, that uh, they're helping themselves, you know, uh, not just helping their two arms or whatever. Because a lot of guys, we had guys in there, hurt their backs. Because they had improper form competition. Yeah, I can pitch two eighty. Oh, and guys get down, and next thing you know, the guys got this weight. And there's nobody around, Perspire. and he can't hold it. Oh, he can't shit. hold it. And the weight comes down. The guy cracks his collarbone right in. The weight comes down. Just gosh. But it's interesting because the way you've described it is as really being a liaison to them and providing them a bit of direction, you know. 
A motivation and direction. I mean, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink, but if you that's lead it... That's the same thing, that's right. Yeah, if you lead it, then it's thirsty and it should probably, with the wherewithal, you know, try yeah. something be- good for itself, yeah. maybe. But you have to be aware the the the, uh, the, the uh, jail itself. You have to be able to utilize it in regards to... Uh, when people came out of certain areas, like say a top floor, mm-hmm. and they came down the stairwells, it was the only place in that jail that nobody could see. Nobody. Oh. So you better be on the ball if you knew there was something going on and get somebody at the bottom and somebody at the top to watch the stairwell because when they came down the stairwell and turned and go down the other one, that's where people got sometimes killed. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Because everything else, it was, uh, but in those stairwells, guys coming up. And uh, the planning was unreal. These guys, they planned to get rid of somebody, they planned and planned. They knew what he ate, when, and we all went to squats and did some put, you know, there's the other thing. And the staff there, and they finished their meal, and it was a metal tray with all like, and they finished the meal, then they walk out, and there's a staff member, and they got these uh, uh, pails, and they put knife here, fork there, spoon there, and the tray, it drops into this big flat thing. Okay. And, and they go boom, and in goes the tray. But the staff, through repetition, can't do it. We are training things where you could get somebody to observe somebody in a cell block or whatever, and we found out the maximum, the maximum time that staff member can concentrate on that was 21 minutes. After 21 minutes, a staff member watching, he starts seeing different things. Yeah. He, his mind, he starts thinking. He doesn't see, there's people, we had guys right there, told him what was gonna go on, and the staff watching and watching and watching and watching and watching. It happened right in front of him. A guy came in and broke this guy's jaw, hit him with his leg of a table, just step around there. The guy's in his bed, brought this table. They had a table thing where they could play chess and checkers. Sure. And broke the leg off it. And then came in there and hit this guy in there and broke all his jaw. The staff didn't even see it. Wow. You know, wow. he's watching, he's watching, he's watching. And the guy just walking and watching. He's, all he can see is the, the inmate in there. The inmate's still in there. You know, he's, under, he's unconscious. Wow. And I, was that commonplace for that type of violence to happen? Yeah. Then? yeah. You see, the inmates know that, that uh, you can only concentrate for so long. On one thing before you get On distracted or as yeah. you say, you and start like seeing different things. And watching to see if somebody's packing a knife out of somewhere you now. Yeah. Now he's watching, he's watching, watching, you know, the knife, the forks, the spoons are going in there. You've got three different things. And, uh, but they were smart. They'd go over there, knife, fork, and spoon, and they go, boom, they throw the spoon in there. And then they throw the fork in there and they throw whatever in there, and then the other one, then they go like that, and they would kick. They would kick the bucket, and you hear, bang! The guy's got it right, right up Right up there. his sleeve, so that so... But the staff were waiting, bang, bang, bang. Bang, bang, bang. That's bang, what they bang, heard. Bang, bang. So they covered it up. But bang, 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 no. Right. <laughs> it's bang, bang, and he... So... Can you condemn the staff? Because psychologically, we start, you know, repetitious, same thing over and over. Next thing you know, it's not even happening, but oh, it's okay. You know? So if they could only concentrate on the cutlery for 21 minutes and count it and make sure it was going in the right bin, um, 
I would, in my mind, would they do some sort of like a lifeguard switch off? Because lifeguards can only stay in one station for about 20 minutes before yeah. their attention span. And that's why you constantly see lifeguards rotating. Yeah. Was there enough staff to do that or no? N not really. The only way I figured it out is that these people, and they used to be what they called in the dining room, so there's 400 guys coming in now there, uh, they had a position, there was a big post, and the staff would stand in, and there there's two uh, stainless steel shelves, and the inmates take their tray, mm -hmm. and they go down, boom, boom, potatoes, carrots, bam, bam, hamburger, beef, whatever. So it somebody is. served them on the tray. Yeah, and yeah. the staff's watching that. He's yeah. got them, and so you watch these guys. They come out with their tray, and it's like that. And, and they walk like that past him. And so he should look and see, uh, it, but can he concentrate? You know, they've got this. Lots of times, this guy is coming out along, he's got his tray, <coughs> and before he turns to come out with the staff, is so that far away, before he does that, this inmate takes his meat and slides it onto this guy's tray. That's a payment. I was going to say, it's a payment yeah, for that's something. that's payment. That would, food was a big thing there. And you, to stop it, and so the staff, they watch every tray. Sure, they see their tray, but the guy, his thumb over here, and uh, you know, or whatever, or he's got, he's carrying this way. So, because of his reputation, all the staff could see, you know, the guy's got potatoes, he had the carrots, he had the rice pudding, and whatever. Half of that stuff wasn't there, but that could see it. Oh, yeah, I hear that, I see him. I think, I said, look, you know. So we'd sometimes, I was said with the inmates, you know, you know give that guy you meet, give the guy that, the carrot. So the guy come out, and the guy sees the tray, he doesn't see each section if there's anything in it. He just saw the tray. Not so that after there was a while, in it. you walk along with nothing in the tray. The tap. <laughs> so there's only so much pressure uh, you can put on yourself, right? Uh, to do that. So the only way to beat a lot of that stuff, the guy on the point, he was there 14 minutes. 14 minutes. He's watching. He's out of there. Somebody who's watching, watching, the longest we could, I can figure, keep somebody there, 22 minutes. 22 minutes of watching that up there because we know something's going to happen and this guy's watching either down in the cell or uh, anyhow. So, but as an administrator, you have to understand how they think. Yes. And uh, and they're smart, they're way ahead of you. And staff always think they're smarter than the inmate, which is a which is a real bad thing. Right. Because they know how anyhow. So so my life in that business was uh, learning, learning and learning. And learning some more. Yeah. Any time you say I, I okay, I know. You're done. Because these boys are coming up with new methods and everything else. Anyhow, I met a lot of people, parents, and helped a lot of young kids. And uh, because, uh, you know, as I say, I got a thing up there from a guy. It's, uh, I don't know if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's a calendar, honey. So, and the other thing right beside it, the guy gave him, he said, you know, he's back from Winnipeg. He was an editor. Uh, the main newspaper in Winnipeg. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and he sent me a letter and he said, uh, I just want to thank you. Uh, I didn't realize it, but I got my son back. And he didn't mean the person. It was his kid. Yeah, yeah. They were back together and everything else. He lost his mother, and that was part of the whole thing of his dad and him and all this. So, hey, so... Yeah, I get a little saying, hey. That's that's interesting. But I just look at it this way. <laughs> I was doing my job. Next time on the Beautifully Ridiculous Podcast. Going into the uh, 
Catholic priest's office because the priest had started counseling the guy and whatever. And uh, in this one case, gave the kid, hey, here's the key. And, you know, they're in a corridor and, and the kid goes in there, slashed them all up, bled Slash to death. the priest? The only reason people knew is out from the door came this blood. Oh, Tom. But it was too late for the kid, you know. So the kid died or the priest oh, died? Oh, he died, yeah. Oh, the kid had slashed himself. Yeah. Oh. Thanks for being here, friend. Join us next time on the Beautifully Ridiculous Podcast. Hey, I'm beautifully ridiculous. Yeah, I'm such a happiness. La-da-dee-da, so I'm